Welcome to another Whitehead Moncton podcast hosted by myself, Antonio Fletcher, head of the employment team, together with my colleague, uh, Lydia Ashman, who's a solicitor in the employment team. Uh, we're looking ahead at 2024 today. We face what is almost certainly a, an election year, a cost of living crisis at the moment, a difficult time for both employers and employees, and a time where there is plenty of new legislation coming in into play, um, some of which taking into account the fact that it is an election year might be deemed to be quite populist from um, an outside perspective with the government trying to show how they look after the electorate. Well, we are in a period of um, substantial difficulty um, for, for most people from an economic basis. Uh, and um, I think it's fair to say that we're starting to see a bit of a shift um, in employers' conduct um, at the moment towards their employees. Um, we've we've started to have a few um, a few more notifications of redundancies, both from employer clients um, asking us to to help with those, as well as um, um, settlement agreements. Um, which involve individuals who who, who are being made redundant. Um, do you think that's a, a fair reflection uh, at the moment, Lydia? Yeah, I would say it's a fair reflection of the current landscape and the changes that are going forwards. Yeah, and, and, and it, it, there's also a, um, a a raft of new legislation and, and and changes that are that are coming in over the course of this year. So I think the biggest family friendly benefits that the government are really introducing are the extended protection for um, pregnant employees or those returning from maternity leave and protection from redundancy. Um, given the current landscape of economic landscape for employers and things like that, actually that's quite a crucial assurance for people that are returning from maternity leave and um, to know that their job in theory is secure for uh, potentially an 18 month period. Um, which which is quite significant now um, because actually a lot of households need two incomes um, in going forwards now. Another one that's actually quite a, a, a significant change, I would say, is the, the change to protection for um, or the changes in paternity leave for fathers um, when they have a new baby. So previously the legislation has been that fathers can take two weeks off but it has yeah. to be as soon as the child is born. Mm -hmm. Now they're being given a luxury, I guess, mm -hmm. in that they can take two one-week breaks um, at any point in the period, in the one-year period after um, the child has been born, or they can take it in two in a two-week block, um, which they haven't been able to do before with the two separate weeks. Yeah. Yeah, well, speaking for some, from from the perspective of someone who has had paternity leave in the past, it was quite restrictive. And um, um, w w back at the time that I took it, in terms of when you had to take it and what it was for, and and those sorts of things, and and, and you find that actually you probably don't make the best use of uh, that leave at the time. So hopefully, this this is the kind of change that will allow um, those taking paternity leave to to to, to be able to to take greater advantage of that. I think it is important to focus on the, 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 the additional protection around maternity leave, but also those returning um, from, from shared parental leave and adoption leave as well. There was a lot of protection in pri previous law um, for those that were on maternity leave around redundancy, uh, but that sort of disappeared the moment they returned um, from, from from maternity leave before, and, and uh, or still the case currently. Um, uh, which let, let left people very vulnerable um, at a time where they may have been away from work for a sustained period of time, uh, may feel a bit as if they'd been forgotten by their employer, uh, and then um, sort of coming back or, or, or sometimes not being allowed back um, immediately after maternity leave and not benefiting from that additional protection. So um, hopefully these these changes will will afford that additional protection. Um, another big change is around flexible working um, and, and the right to have a day one flexible working request 
um, when when you join a business rather than having to wait um, a, a a period of time as as you do currently. What's um, what's your view on that? It's a mixed view. It's positives because people can go in, start a new job and make that request straight away. Circumstances could change between when they accept the job and when they start. That means that actually they need to be able to work more flexibly. However, it is the sort of conversation that you would typically expect an employee to have with their employer leading into the negotiations for the new job. Mm. Um, so in so on that on that side, it, it almost seems that actually as soon as you're starting your job, you're already requesting to make changes to your um, employment contract, which is, if it's something that the employer is not expecting, uh, could actually almost cause... I think chaos would be a strong word, but it could actually throw things a little bit and there might have to be other contingency arrangements put in place yeah. if if it's quite a significant request that's put in. But that doesn't mean to say that actually it won't have a positive impact. Yeah. And, and I mean, certainly some of the things around flexible working that people will be more accustomed to from now on changing, for example, the reasons employers can give for turning them down, yeah. um, which may not actually give significant uh, advantages to employees um, compared mm. to, 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 to what, what the case is at the moment. Yeah, and I think one of the things with flexible working that people need to remember is that it's not just about whether you work from home or work in the office and how you manage that. Flexible working comes in many shapes and forms. And so I think that's actually something that employers in their thinking need to bear in mind going forwards. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach and every person will be different and it might just be about finding a common ground to find a positive solution. Employees from the 6th of April will be able to have a day on right to request flexible working. Um, it's, it's received mixed responses, um, particularly given that it's, it's the kind of conversation, flexible working, that you'd expect a prospective employee to be having with their future employer leading into the role rather than coming in on the first day and saying, I'd like to make a request to work more flexibly. The difficulty there, though, is that circumstances could change for the employee between when they're offered the job and when they start. So there is actually a need for that flexible working request to be made. But on the other hand, it seems odd that an employee should be able to come into a new role on completely new terms and make an adjustment to those terms from the off. So that's why in some some respects it's received a bit of a mixed response um, in, in terms of the application of it. But employees need to remember going forwards as well that flexible working isn't just work from home, being in the office or working part time or full time or different hours. It, it can come in many shapes and forms. So actually, it may be that an employee may be able to do what would be prescribed as their full time hours, but actually work them across different days of the week in different ways yeah. so it's employers need to sometimes may need to think outside the box and take a more holistic approach and 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 move forwards that way because it's not a one size fits all and that may provide positive steps going forwards yeah i think that's good advice for em employers generally because when we still have a labor market shortfall uh, at mm -hmm. the moment in in many industry sectors um so adapting the ways that, that, that employers work and trying to be more flexible may attract um, different people into the workforce that, that might otherwise not um, not form part of it. Um, it's important to note, I think, with the flexible um, working changes that although they do enhance benefits for employees, um, they, they are still um, the same reasons that an employer can give um, for declining flexible working requests um, that, um, that that have been there um, all along and are there currently, uh, which from that perspective, it's questionable how much um, of an advantage uh, employees will, will get from that day one right as well. Another area that's had quite a lot of attention in the media is around um, protection from harassment at work. Um, there's been a, a few very high profile um, cases, um, particularly in, in hospitality retail um, environments. The initial legislation 
was quite expansive in terms of suggesting that the, the protection would extend to third parties and, and preventing harassment from third parties as well. Notably, that's been quite watered down in terms of the legislation that is is coming into effect. Uh, but it does um, it does give employers food for thought as well in terms of having to improve a lot of their systems. Um, what do you think about that? I think that's the key takeaway from it is the impact that it's going to have going forward and that employers will need to take a, a considered look at what they have in place to protect those that work for them um, and what, if anything, can be done um, possibly to give a safer voice as well to people going forwards because that's one of the, the crucial parts in yeah. this as well. Yeah, and, and I think a big focus on training, especially when you're looking at managers and people that may be um, receiving concerns and complaints and making sure that they know how to deal with um, those issues um, appropriately uh, and not uh, not let them pass by is going to be another key focus, mm. potentially with a, um, with awards also being subject going forward to, to an uplift in harassment claims of up to 25%. Um, it's, it's certainly food for thought, um, not only in terms of providing a, a suitable and nice working environment for your staff, but also um, you know, in, in terms of cold, hard cash for, for, for employers as well. Speaking of, uh, of cold, hard cash, we, we, we've, we've got the largest um, increases ever in the national living wage about to, to, to come in as well. Um, so those will um, create further costs for employers. Um, as, as do the the pressures um, at a time where inflation has been high and the cost of living has gone up to to, to increase salaries generally. Uh, and again, this is, in, in my view, an area that makes employers um, have to face some difficult decisions about their workforce going forward. Yeah, I think it's it's one of those things as well where if you're looking at you know the national living wage, you've got to factor in the increase for people that are on that. But also if you've got those that are beyond that, how do you then take that into account as well? Mm. Given that there is the cost of living crisis at the moment, um, you know, you may find that employees will actually feel a bit, could feel a bit hard but done by if there are those that are receiving, although it's statutory, are receiving an uplift yeah. and those, you know, that aren't. Um, so as you said, employees will be having to make tough decisions and the chances are they'll try and make costs where they can, but ultimately that may then end up reflecting and turning back on the workforce yeah. going forwards um, because we've seen an increase in redundancies going forwards too. Yes, exactly. It's, it's, it's those kind of cost pressures on employers as to, you know, can, can we afford to have um, 10 people earning, um, you know, sort of, let's say for argument's sake, a couple of thousand pounds more um, mm. than, than um, you know, or do we perhaps have to look at trimming those numbers down in order to absorb that cost. Uh, another tricky point for employers is, is where you have uh, differentiation between earning levels. And um, you can think about manufacturing, you can think about uh, retail, you can think about um, education when, when you have this sort of discussion is if, if, if the national living wage goes up so much that it almost removes all your bandings in terms of skill levels um you either have to bump everyone's salary up or mm. accept that actually uh, more skilled workers may be earning uh, the same amount as as lower skilled workers and at that point that could result in problems with the workforce thinking well what why am i upskilling why am i taking on this extra mm. responsibility if i am getting little or no reward for it absolutely uh, so it's a it's a very difficult balance to strike Beyond that, uh, um, I think the only other thing to touch on really is is around where where we stand with um, employment tribunals at the moment. Certainly, um, a lot of the more recent listings that that we've come across um, in, uh, in in recent months suggest that the tribunal system is still facing a heavy backlog. Um, that it's difficult to get cases listed promptly. Um, and if we are now facing a, a, a time where it might be harder for individuals to find work um, once they leave a job or more people leaving work, be it through redundancy or otherwise, uh, in the months ahead, um, then 
I at least have concerns about whether the tribunal system is going to be able to cope and, and, and what future backlogs might look like. Yes, that's a big problem at the moment. You know, there are some tribunals that are being listed, you know, late into 2025 now. And the the risk that you, the risk that the tribunal system is running is that actually by having hearings so late after the application has been made that actually people's memories are distorted. And so actually when you may get to a hearing, not everyone remembers the situation exactly as it was. And that will have, that could ultimately have a negative impact on the outcome for either party involved. So it's it's not just about the claims itself, it's actually about the long-term impact on people's, you know, the individual's memories of the parties involved and things like that. Yeah, and, and people move on and are harder to track down and maybe less inclined to be involved in a in a hearing. So it, it certainly impacts on um impacts on justice beyond mm. um you know the, the, the what can be actually very severe financial impacts on um, both employers and employees yeah. in those situations well thank you very much um for your time lydia and thank you all for joining us on this podcast and hope to speak to you all soon for more information about our employment law services please do visit the employment pages on our website whitehead-monkson.co.uk